so shall we uh, shall we start okay proceed a warm good morning so it's our last day and the third day of our international ecolocum so today we are having five excellent speakers from throughout the globe the first speaker is dr fernando elagora from mexico so uh, it's my pleasure to invite uh, ms anuj panar assistant professor from christ college for introducing our first speaker ma'am over to you thank you tarun sir um, our first speaker is from mexico and he is dr fernando eloriaga well plakan he is a full time professor and researcher at the interdisciplinary center for marine sciences of the national polytechnic institute in la paz mexico his researches mainly revolves around the ecology of mini pets distributed in mexican islands such as guadalupe san benito and others along the gulf of california the recent research efforts of his analyze the guadalupe fur seal and its population recovery in conjunction with dietary analysis and its relationship to climate variability during his career he has published more than 70 scientific articles of international recognition he has uh, directed and supervised uh, research thesis of more than 30 students previously he was working as a coordinator of the national network of marine mammal strandings and currently he serves as the president of the mexican society of marine mammal mammalogy he is also working as the coordinator of the science committee of the same society with this i welcome you sir for the talk over to you sir thank you thank you uh can you see me can you see my screen yes sir sir you can screen see your screen perfect thank you well uh first of all uh i would like to thank you all for this kind of invitation it is a true honor for me to be here from mexico into this important colloquium uh as, as the presenter kindly introduced introduced me I live in Mexico right now. I am here in this red spot in the left. Right now it's almost 11 p.m. in the night and it is a really pleasure to be staying up late uh, for this important important event. So um of course uh, I'm going to give you some insights about uh, this topic I will be talking to you about the role of this group of marine mammals we have studied over over the last the last years in relation to climate variability particularly how they are considered sentinels of uh, the ecosystem i would like to begin with a very small introduction to you so that you are very well aware of who the pinnipeds are We are talking about these three families of marine carnivores. These are about uh, 20, 28% of marine mammal biodiversity overall. And these are, uh, this, here you can see a general view of who the pinnipeds are. These are the three families of the slide before, the Otaridae family, sea lions and fur seals. Here is the fossidae family, the true seals, and the walruses here in the lower uh, uh, area of your, of your screen. These uh, marine carnivores are, have a cosmopolite uh, distribution. They are located all around the world. However, they have an anti-tropical distribution. What does it mean? it means that the smallest populations the smallest biomasses will be located in the tropics here in this area where these endangered species are located here in red in contrast we will have the largest biomasses the largest populations of pinnipeds towards the poles 
in the Antarctic and in the Antarctica, the largest beyond masses. So even though they are located all around the world, we have this pattern in their distribution. And this is related to their high energetic requirements. Uh, since they are large animals, they are uh, very conspicuous and uh, they need a large amount of resources to be viable. The, la the highest the latitude is, the largest the biomass that we have will be available for these species. There are some authors that have considered these animals in general, pinnipeds, other marine mammals, and other taxa, of course, not only marine mammals, as sentinels ecosystem, uh, ecosystem sentinels. These authors uh, have this definition for a sentinel of the ecosystem, a species that will respond to this variability or change in a timely, measurable, and interpretable way. In this regard, we will be having this kind of species that have a high trophic position, have high uh, energetic requirements. That's why they have this tendency of distributing to the Arctic and to the Antarctica. They will be sensitive to these changes as good sentinels. They will have a large, uh, a long lifespan. There are pinnipeds that can live up to 30 years. Some of them can live up to 40. There is a seal in Russia the Baikal seal that can live up to 55 years, maybe the oldest, uh, the oldest capability by this, by this pinniped within the group. And they are conspicuous and have a wide range. This characteristic of being conspicuous is really useful for us in order to study these animals. We are able to go to the islands and make censuses, uh, capture pups in order to weight them, to measure them, and then release them. Also to get samples out of animals and do specific analysis in order to determine the effect of variability on these species for our habits, for example, on their population dynamics. As good sentinels of the ecosystem, they will be good indicators. They will be good biomonitors of productivity, prey availability. Some authors have mentioned them as integrators of air environmental variability. And several species have been uh, tagged like this, not only pinnipeds. Other ones like the sea otters, several species of dolphins, manatees, of course, the polar bear, and other taxa that may not be marine mammals. It's important to say that not only marine mammals can be considered sentinels. There are other taxa that could be considered good sentinels too. But we work with pinniped. So uh, tonight, or well, uh, for you this morning, I will be talking about the pinnipeds. Of course, the California sea lion has been also considered a good sentinel of the ecosystem. There are different studies that have tracked presence of contaminants in the blubber of these top predators in coast of California, for example. So these marine mammals, these pinnipeds, will be highly sensitive to environmental factors, both natural and anthropogenetic. It is no surprise. It is a fact, a well-known fact, that climate variability is present in our planet. Good indicators of these changes have been displayed by several species of flora and fauna that have displaced into northern latitudes, changing their distribution because of the increment of air temperatures. This is a graphic that may be very well known for you about how CO2 concentrations have elevated in the last decades, in the last century and a half, as well as temperatures in our planet, both in land and in the oceans. We can see uh, frequently this kind of news 
this went out just about 10 days ago about how for the first time in a very particular area of Greenland, it rained for the first time ever. It was a record. It had never rained before. And it happened because of the increment of temperatures in the area. There are other solid studies about how the Arctic is melting. There are some um, assessments that evidence how this ice extent has a reduction of about 12% per decade since the end of the 70s, at least until 2010. This is a lot. And this has a lot of impact on this kind of species. In a particular way, the pinnipeds, the, the ones species we will be talking about the most. Here, these are highly dependent on ice. Many of these species depend on, on this substrate in order to accomplish their maternal, uh, their maternal care. Many of these pinnipeds have really short periods of maternal care, up to a few days, a couple of weeks, and they depend on the vulnerability of this ice extension so that they can accomplish this maternal care. There are recent studies that describe how there has been a large pup mortality. Many of these pups of these species in the Arctic have died because these ice extensions are more vulnerable, are melting quickly, are unpredictable, and some of these maternal cares are not being able to go all the way to the end. And many of these pups die in the process. There are other cases like for the walrus. You may have seen these kinds of images. I'm, I'm going to take it away in just that moment because it is a really rough video. It went out about two years ago in a documentary how walruses, because of this reduction in ice habitat, they are moving to some areas where there are cliffs. They climb up. And when they tried to went down, they fell and died. It was, it was really rough to see that. There is a publication about this, this not particularly this behavior that uh, you saw a little bit in the video, not so much that, but how this, those, this world war, war races, this was published this year, how at least females and juveniles move away from these ice extensions because they are not so available anymore and they go ashore in summer to coastal beaches. And the main effect, the negative effect, is that they move away from productive clam beds that are by the ice extensions. So by moving away, there is an energy waste that was not present before. In the Antarctica, happens the same, although here we have other predators, like the leopard seal, the one you see here below, it's an important predator of these seals in the upper area of the slide. And how these animals go into the water, the same case as in the Arctic, pups that do not, weigh, do not go all the way until the end of lactation. Some of them go into the water before it's time. And they can, this is a problem that is projected to be really significant for these species, increasing the predation rates caused by these pups going to water in a premature way. So there are some interactions there in between prey and predators that may also be altered. And this can be measured by behavior of the animals and that are in these ice conditions. Now, you could think that only the pinnipeds in the ice have this effect by global warming. Not so much. Let me introduce to you the northern elephant seal. This is one of the four species of pinnipeds that we have in Mexico, in my country. The other one is the California sea lion, the Galapagos, the, excuse me, the Guadalupe fur seal, and the harbor seal. What has happened with the northern elephant seal? Here you can see its distribution in my country, in Mexico. Here is Mexico, United States, Central America. And here you can see the colonies in Mexico, in the Pacific. 
we shared some of the distribution with United States. And in the last 25 years, colonies have declined. The main colonies located in islands like Guadalupe, San Benito, Cedros, they have gone down in the last 25 years. 25 years ago, we contributed as the Mexican uh, distribution of elephant seals with 25% of pop production. In the last decade, only 11%. And why has this happened? These are large animals, as you can see in the picture. They have important uh, layers of blubber. These are very important thermic isolators. But what happens if temperature is increasing? These animals get into an stress, into hyperthermia, because they overheat because of these high temperatures. So what happens that the animals here in these warm areas in Mexico are starting, or at least they have done it for the last 25 years, starting to go north to areas where it is cooler for them. They don't have the foraging areas here because they forage in the Northern Pacific. They stay on these islands for molting, uh, for reproducing. They stay on the beaches like this, fasting, not eating, at least adults are not eating, but they overheat. So you can see a very good example of how climate change is impacting this species in Mexico by changing its distribution. There are other kind of phenomena that have also been probably increased. These are some arguments by other authors that have increased in its frequency. And I am talking about algal blooms that are toxic. Why? Because in the last decades, you know how CO2 has increased in a significant manner. Well, uh, the dinoflagellites have a greater affinity for these conditions with greater elevations of CO2. They like that. And they are responsible for the majority of these algal blooms that are toxic for this kind of uh, species and many, many other species. I would like to talk to you a little bit about an event the largest mortality event that we have ever had in Mexico happened exactly one year ago in September of last year. And it was as a result of a toxic algal bloom in the Pacific Ocean. All these black circles is where all these almost 450 animal, animals stranded, these California sea lions die there and we have never had an event like that. So this probably increased uh, their frequency or their intensity in algal blooms could be a consequence. There may be other factors in, involved, of course, but it has been argued that climate change may be related to this. This is something very important. This is some evidence by other authors, how they have described uh, these frequencies of warming events, such as El Nino, these warm events that uh, have their origin in the, in the equator. For the Central Pacific, these authors have described an increment in how often they occur, in the Central Pacific at least, and in the Eastern Pacific, they have described how the intensity of these El Nino events uh, could be happening uh, on conditions of climate change. These authors mentioned how in the last four centuries, they did this reconstruction by corals and this kind of analysis assessments. And they described how in the last 400 years, probably, the El Nino events stronger have been the one in 1982, 1997, and 2015. Maybe the three most intense El Nino in four centuries. So this is something very remarkable 
So as you can see, climate can have a different type of effects by this kind of phenomena, like El Nino, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that, and warming, like the case in the, for the northern elephant seals, or the pinnipeds in the Arctic and in the Antarctica. The thing with El Nino is that, as you well know, these changes in the physics of the ocean by sea surface temperature have an effect in the base of tropic west. There is a, dec a decrement of primary productivity, and there will be a subsequent change in prey availability for a lot of species, not only pinnipeds, other predators, other consumers, they will all be affected by these changes caused by the increment of temperature of this phenomena. And of course, their critical habitat will be altered. Critical habitats defined as those ecological units that are required for a successful reproduction and feeding. And of course, there is going to be an impact in the case of pinnipeds on offspring, on the survival of pups. And this is something that we can measure when we go to the islands. And this effect on survival on pups can be traduced in the long run into population dynamics, population trends. And I will show you an example a little bit further. The pinnipeds and El Nino are two components that have been analyzed for several decades. This is a book uh, of the, from the beginning of the 90s, and they described a lot of cases how these warming events that affect primary productivity and prey, uh, uh, primary productivity and prey availability, they, it affects the pinnipeds in terms of an increase for an effort because there is a prey shortage. So as a consequence, it's gonna be a reduction in pups body mass. You can see the picture, two pups of California sea lions one of them really fat, really big, the other one really thin. This is a consequence of mother uh, California sea lions having a different success in order to obtain resources during El Nino events. There is going to be a reduction in fertility of females, and in general, there's going to be an increase of mortality. This, is, um, this couldn't be more evident than in the pinniped from the equator. As you remember, this anti-tropical distribution of pinnipeds in the equator by the Galapagos Islands, we have two species of otterites. We have the, Gal the Galapagos sea lion and we have the Galapagos fur seal. Here you can see their abundances by 2018. They are both considered endangered, but I, I really, really want you to see is how they have declined after El Nino of 2015, almost 24% and almost 38, 38%. They are located in the Galapagos. It's like an oasis, an oasis in the middle of the ocean. So these oceanographic events really have an impact on these animals and their survival. I know for a better understanding of how these animals are impacted by these warming events, take a look of, at this study by McClatchy and collaborators in California. This is no longer for an El Nino year, no. This is like a, a little bit longer of a series from 2004 to 2013. Once again, California sea lions that we have in Mexico, in the United States too, it's maybe the most common species. And you can see how in regarding their prey in this series, you can see a decline of their main prey, anchovy and sardine. At the same time, other species have increased in their diet, the rockfish and the market squid. These prey are not as convenient for the California sea lion in terms of energetics their main prey are going down, so they have to switch to other type of prey into what some authors have called the junk food effect, impacting these populations 
for California sea lions, other species of sea lions in the north, the stellar sea lion. But this is very evident for these locations in California, which at the end result in this. These are pups, these are newborns, and how they have declined their weight. At the same time, these changes in prey have happened too. These are females, these are males, it doesn't matter. They all go down uh, regarding their weight. This same evaluation, type of evaluation was made by us. It was a, a study we published for Mexican island, Mexican islands in, in one side, the California sea lion again, and in the other side, the Guadalupe fur seal. This Guadalupe fur seal, also located in the Mexican Pacific, is endangered by Mexican law, and it is recovering from uh, almost being extinct 100 years ago. And we made this evaluation. We wanted to know how environment was affecting these species by analyzing what took place in 2015. In 2015, as I said before, there was El Nino event, but there was also another phenomena in the North Pacific called the North Pacific uh, heat wave, also called the bluff. This is a uh, work by Kintich in 2015. You can see how this warm water evolved here and went down into the latitude until reaching US and Mexican waters. And this really warmed up because there was a mixture in between the bluff and El Nino. There, is, there are a lot of arguments in oceanography, which I'm not expert at all, but some authors in their articles referred to this El Nino of 2015 as the Godzilla El Nino because of this, uh, uh, this zoom of intensities by two phenomena. Here is where we made this analysis in the San Benito archipelago. Here you can see this small square, or these three small islands. And this is basically what we found. Take a look how these animals are good indicators just by going into the lines and take a look at this. Of course, we need to measure them. We need to do statistics about it. We need to have solid assessment of information. But in general, we saw many pups uh, under starvation conditions. We, what we do when we go to the islands is that we weight the animals. We want to see their weight so that we have that value for one year and then another year and then another year and in some moment being able to compare among different years. And of course, there was a real serious decline in 2015 of about 1.2 kilograms in a, in, a, the, um, in the climb in the weight of California sea lion buffs, which is a lot for these real little animals. Of course, when we go to the islands, like for this study, we do censuses, we count the animals from boats on land, and this is what we found. This is the red line in 2015, how they declined the case of the California sea lion, the California sea lion declined about 50% in relation to the year before, in 14. And this is a stable isotope analysis that we made. I'm not going to get too much into stable isotopes. But I, what I want you to tell, I want to tell you is how more negative values of this isotope ratio means more oceanic foraging away from shore. And when we have more positive values of this isotope ratio, this means for an habit closer to shore, to the coastal environment. So this means that in 2015, they moved away. They increased their foraging effort in order to find resources. Something similar was found for the Guadalupe fur seal, the endangered one, also a decrease of Fifth, uh, around 40, 50, 60% in some cases in 2015 versus 2014. And the isotopic niches were uh, giving this information. In 2015, they were also displayed offshore, 
not so much coastal, but they also increased in their area, which means that they could be increasing their coverage. The largest you have an area for foraging, the more variable you will have these isotopic sources. So this could be a consequence of increased foraging effort. In stable isotopes, this one carbon ratio is really useful for inferring uh, habitat use of consumers. Not only pinnipeds, but cetaceans, sharks, all kinds of, of taxa that we are able to measure. This is how we check the samples for stable isotopes. These are hair samples of individuals, and here's where we measure these isotopic concentrations. And it's very important how everything complemented at the end. In 2015, we saw this important event in Mexico, the graphics I just showed you. And at the same time in California and Washington and Oregon and United States, an unusual mortality event started to take place for the Guadalupe full seal, the one in danger. He is, this is an unusual mortality event that has not stopped until this year. It has not stopped and it involved animals under starvation conditions. So there are, there are characteristics, environmental characteristics right now in the Pacific that have not gone back to normal. And these animals through their unusual mortality events, something very similar to what is happening with gray whales in the same areas is also happening with Guadalupe full seals. And also and in all, all cases, almost all cases, animals really emaciated. In 2015, another uh, member of our group uh, went to Guadalupe Island. Here's where we made the first study in San Benito, the, the, the archipelago I showed you. Guadalupe Island is the main breeding site of Guadalupe full seals, a little bit north. And Cassandra Galvez, who made her masters in our group, she went during these years to Guadalupe Island. And I wanted to see how she was able to measure on land a large number of dead newborns, especially in 2015 again. And I want you to see, please, the red area. This is starvation as mortality cause. She, for her PhD, a little bit after that, and then she published this, this work, we were able to publish this. We relate uh, the sea surface temper, temperature anomalies with newborn's weight. It, this is what she basically found, an inverse relationship in between temperature anomaly of the ocean and weight of the animals. The higher the anomaly was, the lowest the weight of newborns was observed. So you can see very well how these variables can be measured in the field. And more importantly, when we are able to complete a distinct time series in order to make these temporal inferences. She established or we established for this article that by each degree Celsius, there was a decline of almost uh, 1.8 kilograms for Guadalupe full seals. Coming back to the California sea lion, the one before was the Guadalupe full seal. This is the California sea lion again. For California, this was a really large study by these authors in the United States, about 30 years of analysis, recapturing pups that were marked, that were tagged. They were able to study that by each uh, degree Celsius, there was of, of increments in 30 years, there was a decline of about 50% of probability of survival for puffs. That is a lot. That it was especially related to El Nino, El Nino events for California sea lions in California, United States. So when you have this kind of information, it's really useful, especially for pups. But as I was telling you at the beginning, what happens when there is a, a, this starting to get together uh, along a really large series of times? This can be uh, 
or this can result in a population trend. If there is a large mortality of pups, if there is a low fertility by adult females because of these events, in the long run, when you analyze 20 or 30 years of information in a population, you can start seeing declines. And this is the case of another work that we made also uh, from CCMAR, the same as the one before with Cassandra Galvez. This was another student of us, Karen Adame, who made her master's uh, and she was able to publish it. We were able to publish this an important collaboration with another research center, CICESE. And uh, for the California sea lion, in the Gulf of California, here I can, I can give you a, a better look. Again, the distribution of the California sea lion here in the Gulf of California. You can see all the different rockeries, which have all gone down in the last 28, 20, 29 years, in the last 28 years, from 1991 to 2019. There's only one rockery that has not gone into this pattern. What we found here through current study was a 65% decline of California sea lions in the Gulf of California, in this large region here, since the, 19, since the beginning of the 90s to 2019. At the same time, sea surface temperature of the Gulf of California was going up. Of course, it has a strong effect on the trophic dynamics, of colonies switching to prey that are not so energetically uh, convenient for California sea lions, has been a reduction in fertility and pop production. And what is the outcome? A reduction of the population. At the same time, sea surface temperature is going up. The same way it has happened in a lot of oceans all around the world. We are talking about global ocean warming. Okay, so this is the last part of my talk. We have seen how um, temperature can, or these warming events can affect pinnipeds regarding habitat reduction, changing distribution for iron habits, these mortality events related, for example, uh, to algal blooms that are related to CO2 concentration and dinoflagellite that are uh, related to these algal blooms. But you may wonder what, what other kind of a phenomena these top predators are able to reflect and being able to call them sentinels of the ecosystem. There are other anthropogenetic events that have been reflected by these species. This is my fi the final part of my talk. This, is part, this was part of my PhD thesis. Uh, I work with California sea lion and uh, using stable isotopes in the teeth of sea lions. There is an area in Mexico. Here you can see the small map, how uh, uh, the, the study area of, my, of this part of my thesis in Magdalena Bay in the Pacific Mexican, in the Mexican Pacific, excuse me, and this is an area here on this island. This is an, a spot, a red spot for strandings. So we were able to get samples out of a large number of dead sea lions in the last 30, 35 years. Then we were able to go to other, other institutions, the National University in Mexico City, where we were able to get more samples of teeth, you know, to have a large of information in a really long time series. This is what we basically found. Dead animals from, um, from these ones, we were able to get a tooth and do this. Uh, this uh, when you get one of these uh, tooth, you can be able to cut them, do this cut, and being able to reveal uh, annual growth layers in, in the teeth. This is something that has been validated for many species of pinnipeds, many marine mammals, even terrestrial mammals, and a lot of species too. It's a little bit about uh, similar to the rings of the trees. This, uh, this kind of phenomena also take place. 
in in this in this teeth. What you can see here, these holes, long holes, is how we took the sample of the dentine in order to do stable isotopes. Here in the upper area, you can see a clean a clean part of the tooth. In the upper area is where we made the extraction. We only needed one milligram in order to do these stable isotopes. So we are able to go back in time for that particular individual. Basically something like this. This is just a small segment of the information. We were able to go from the 60s all the way to 2010. Each one of these lines would be one C lion. The little skull here would be the moment of the, the year of the stranding. And by counting growth layers that are annual, annual formation, we were able to see how many years it went into the past. So by doing stable isotopes per each one of the years, um, when these uh, layers got together, we were able to reconstruct this kind of series. For example, if we have the year 1977, the value of carbon that we have here is for all the layers that were built in that year by taking the all, all the cell lines that lived in that, in that moment. And the same way for all the rest. So you can see by putting all these animals together, it was about 60 animals, pretty much like that. And especially since the mid seventies, we saw a decline of the carbon ratio, a decline from the 70s to 2010. So um, you can see here the average for each one of the decades, you can see more negative values towards the end and a decline of almost 0.2 parts per thousand per decade. This could be uh, a reflection of the Suez effect which is defined as this atmospheric change, atmospheric change of heavy isotope ratio. In a nutshell, I to tell you that these large increments of CO2 in the atmosphere that eventually go into the ocean are depleted in 13 carbon, are depleted in 13 carbon. So the more CO2 you have in the ocean, the more depleted 13 carbon you will see because this matrix is enriched with 12 carbon. So it is an er a ratio, 13 carbon and 12 carbon. So 13 carbon goes down, at the same time CO2 goes up, especially here in this graph, you can see how from the 60s, it was a really huge problem, these emissions of CO2. And at the end, you were seeing this in the layers of these sea lions a decline of 13 carbon as a probable consequence of that large input of CO2 in the ocean, which is 13 carbon depleted. So that's why you have this trend. You may wonder if this is the only species where this has been found. The answer is no. There are other species like, for example, the bowhead whale, this analysis in baleens, they have also seen this negative strength in the carbon ratio, as well as in other pinniped species like the stutter seal lion, using also the teeth, the northern four seals, and our California sea lion. Here you can see the distribution in the North Pacific of the bowhead whales, the northern four seal, the stellar sea lion, and our California sea lion. So you can see how wide this effect is, and it's just a reflection of what is happening all around the world. So by having the right tissue, we, you, can, you can extract this kind of information and do hypotheses about it. So I just want to finish by summing how these measurable traits uh, are very useful for considering these animals as bioindicators, talking about the pinnipeds. First of all, how we, can able, we are able to measure this habitat reduction, as well as disruption in uh, maternal care and changes in distribution the case of our northern elephant seal going to cooler areas, massive mortality events due to harmful, harmful algae blooms, like this almost 450 uh, massive mortality event that we had in Mexico last year, 
changes in foreign habits due to more frequent warming events that impact prey availability and as a consequence, pup body masses and colony decline, something that we are able to, to measure when we go to the islands and we check the pups. All, 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 all these activities, let me tell you, are done with corresponding uh, research permits, environmental authorities present, all the park rangers from this protected area. We do all this by, uh, by the book. And by doing also censuses, we are able to uh, uh, assess these uh, patterns. These are events are measured in annual terms, but also in decadal terms relating population declines, like has been the case of sea lions in the Gulf of California. And finally, based on the right analysis, for example, stable isotopes that we do a lot in CCMAR here in La Paz, and based on the right tissue, like the teeth, something that could also be, could also be done in other species that are not mammals, for example, sharks, using the vertebrae, how these rings are formed, doing the, uh, the right tissue phenomena, maybe like the Suez effect uh, related to CO2 uh, emission can be obtained and uh, be evidenced by, by, these, by these tools, these biochemical tools. So uh, that would be all. I don't know if you have any, any question. I think I'm just about time. That would be all. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for, 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 your, for, for your attention. I don't know if you have any question or comment. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Fernando, for your uh, uh, extensive research work on pinnipeds and uh, for your uh, very lucid uh, presentation. Uh, with regard to the pinnipeds and their role in uh, as ecosystem sentinels so you have extensively explained and uh, you have given a very good beautiful photographs and about this and uh, i have one question uh, these uh, pinnipeds because of the climate change have they developed any predatory activity any any what kind of activity uh, predatory predatory predation type do they predate uh, on other organisms or something like that? Like a, a prediction out of this phenomena? Uh, no, no, yeah. no, predation, 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 predatory activity. Predation? Uh, uh, yeah. No, th these organisms, because of their habitat reduction, uh, they develop uh, a kind of a predatory activity uh, attacking their uh, other kind of lower organisms or something like that. My, my, my internet is a little bit um, uh, unstable, and and I and I'm not able to to get to get your your question. No, because of this climate change, their habitat reduction is being taking place, uh -huh. isn't it? Yes. Uh, so by that, you know, what kind of uh, ecological changes uh, they are undergoing? Ecological changes mm. where uh, well, it has been especially related to to changes in their in their main in their main prey. This has been really uh, been well documented in our Gulf of California, and it has also been related to over exploitation of sardine. At the same time, this uh, warming could be also causing a, a decrease. So this ecological uh, aspects are being measured in the Gulf, and there is only one colony that has not developed this pattern, and it's just because of its ecology. It's really close from the way out of the Gulf of California, and there are other oceanographic conditions from the Pacific Ocean that may be helping this uh, colony in close to to the mouth of the of the Gulf of uh, the, um, the Gulf of California. But in general. It's all about foreign habits and distribution. There are some colonies that in the long run, if this declining keeps taking place, there is a, a high risk of extinction, for example, for maybe a couple of colonies, if this keeps taking place, the really small colonies that we have right, right now. So you mean to say that uh, some species reduction is going on? Species reduction? 
species species reduction any biodiversity changes oh yes yes of course yeah 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 there especially in relation to these uh, minor pelagic fishes there are some reductions in the ecosystem and not only here in the gulf also in california this reduction of small pelagic fishes that are having an impact all throughout the trophic web at the end these sea lions or these pinnipeds is just one small piece a really small piece but it is part of a big hole where these changes in the base uh, phytoplankton primary productivity uh, fish fishes having an impact all throughout the 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 trophic the trophic web of course yeah yeah my final clarification is uh, because of this climate changes and other thing these pinnipeds uh, they develop a kind of a ecological adjustment or why because a struggle for existence hmm. uh, yeah. any kind of ecological adjustments they are developing among themselves Yes, there, there are some of them are, are, are struggling, and, and especially the ones in tropical areas, uh, like in the equator. There are some uh, monk seals that inhabit in areas in the tropics where there is uh, as important presence of corals. So because of acidification of the oceans, these corals are really being affected, and also prey that are related to those corals and are prey of these monk seals in Hawaii, for example. So they are really struggling. That's why many of these species in the tropics, since the old days, they have been endangered, they have been declining, but because of climate change, this high vulnerability that they always have, this could increase even, even more. And of course, we are seeing this a little bit north in both hemispheres, in temperate areas that are becoming a little bit more tropical. Uh, so you, you, you can see that effect by starting, by starting from the tropics and going a little bit uh, into the higher latitude, both Northern Hemisphere and, and Southern Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fernando, uh, for your excellent talk. And also you have taken us to the Mexican coast. Yeah, of course. You are invited to come whenever, whenever you want. Yes. You are welcome. Yes. Now Thank over you so much. to Tarun. Yeah. Thank you, Fernando, sir. Now we are we are already late, so I would like to invite uh, Professor Jamon Sunny for introducing our next speaker. Over to you, sir. Okay, my duty here is to introduce Professor Dr. Hasrisal bin Shari from Malaysia. He is going to talk on the topic Geochemical Records of Marine Core Sediment of the Sunda Shelf South Southern South China Sea during Holocene. He is a senior lecturer in marine geochemistry at the Faculty of Science, Marine and Environment at University. Malaysia, Tarangunu, UMT. He joined UMT June 2004 as a fisheries officer. He did his BSc honors in marine science at University Putra, Malaysia, UPM, in 2002. And his MSc he did in marine geochemistry at UMT in 2007. He did his PhD in environmental science from Hokkaido University, Japan in 2013. He was head of University Malaysia Tarangunu Marine Research Station and director of Central Laboratory there. He is currently director of Center of Research and Field Service. His area of specialization is mainly marine geochemistry. He has published over 35 articles in various scientific journals. He has been supervising five PhD students and many UG and PG students in their projects. Along his academic journey, he was awarded many national and international research grants and pursuing research in various aspects of environmental studies. Other than academics and research, he is involved in 
geological society of malaysia malaysia natural natural society analysis european geological union egu etc over to you sir professor dr hasri sal bin shari okay thank you very much uh, mr uh, thank you very much so much the uh, chairperson and uh, all of the committee members uh, to uh, for this program actually i am uh, honored to uh, wait uh, okay sorry i will try to share the the Okay, I'm actually I'm uh, very happy to join this uh, colloquium, uh, and uh, really happy because uh, uh, Dr. Tarun always contacted me uh, to to inform the program, and this kind of uh, research actually I try to present uh, what we we conducting in the uh, South China Sea uh, regarding on the. Uh, what we call it, uh, geochemical record of marine core sediment uh, of the Sunda Shelf, Southern South China Sea, during the Holocene. So, uh, when I look at on the schedule today, um, most of the uh, research uh, presented today more about uh, the modern uh, or recent past uh, condition due to the climate change and uh, so on. But here. Yes, I am. Uh, Sometimes I am a bit, a bit uh, uh, try to uh, uh, try to make people understand about uh, this uh, field. Actually, when I talk about uh, uh, paleo and winter changes, uh, paleo climate changes, people will ask me, "What is TIPS? What is that uh, kind of study? What is paleo actually?" So I just uh, thinking about uh, for modern uh, climate, uh, modern uh, condition. You can have uh, many devices to 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 understand about uh, the changes, the modern changes. But when you want to understand about the past climate and the past and the changes, you need a uh, kind of uh, proxies that uh, reflect what the environmental changes uh, happen in the specific time being. So unless we will have like a machine, time machine, like a back to the future. This kind of uh, machine, if we have now, we can back to the future, uh, back to the our past uh, uh, time frame to understand about the past climates or past climate changes. But uh, there's our limitation, our obstacle. We don't have this kind of a time machine. So to understand about the past climates uh, or past environmental changes, we need to have a uh, uh, proxy. So, okay. So, thank you very much again for the uh, committees of the colloquium for inviting me to this colloquium to, to give a talk about uh, our, our study in the uh, South China Sea. Okay, this is about the brief uh, about South China Sea actually. Uh, the, South, uh, the South China Sea is a part of, uh, I mean, the southern part of the energy because uh, so can I say we can divide into two uh, categories. Like uh, first is the uh, northern part of the sea and the uh, north southern part of the sea. And the uh, Sunda Chef is located in the southern part of the sea. And then is uh, uh, what we call it uh, uh, more kind of uh, submerged continent that's located between Indochina, Peninsula, Sumatra. Java and also Borneo Island. This region, uh, if we know that's uh, influenced much currently by the monsoon, Asian monsoon system, not this monsoon and also Southwest monsoon in the modern, modern uh, uh, climate uh, in, uh, ecosystem. Or then uh, we have also decadal uh, influenced by El Nino, La Nina, and that's one is a modern uh, uh, phenomenon that affects the climate in this region. But uh, for, so this one I want to show you about uh, the transition of Sunda land. So you can imagine during the uh, LGM, last glacial maximum, this area is a very big uh, uh, land uh, territory. That's, uh, we can see that's a tip of uh, continents. There is a Sunda land here. 
and then to when uh, the uh, ice melt ice start melting when it's moved to the Holocene period. Uh, uh, majority or major area in the Sunda Chef is inundated by uh, seawater due to the sea level rise, and uh, this area is submerged by the seawater. Okay. And so our aim actually for this study is to uh, try to understand about the past marine productivity in the Sunda Chef of the East Coast Peninsula of Malaysia, especially during the Holocene by using the geochemical uh, proxy and to fill in the information uh, gap about the uh, parameter change in this area. So I try to bring all of you, but try to understand about uh, the uh, proxy and archive. Okay, we can just uh, imagine about the, the public library. Yes, uh, all of you maybe uh, have entered the public library. You can see the several sections like uh, uh, PO sciences, uh, and then uh, uh, literature se uh, section and so on. And uh, from this kind of a section, we will have the archive that's a, a store like a, uh, manuscript, all manuscript, all testament, or all book, uh, all book in this area, and uh, this is a from the shelf. We can pick what kind of the old book or manuscript or journal from the archive. So it's similar to the ocean. So now we back to the ocean when we want to study about the paleo environmental changes or paleo productivity in this uh, uh, context. The ocean, ocean we can uh, like uh, for my uh, for uh, some uh, for my uh, uh, field normally I try to simplify the science and try to make it the people to understand about the the science itself. So uh, we can uh, the simple analogy here. Ocean is like the public library. It's very huge area, and so from the ocean we can extract or we can get the core sediment. Core sediment is like the archive, and then from the archive we can pick the proxies that so we can we, we enable us to study about the past and the changes. It's like uh, you can imagine your uh, telephones, your handset. Okay, when you have a smartphone here, there's a, so many uh, information inside there, so many application inside your 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 smartphone. So the smartphone is like. Uh, uh, core sediments, and then so uh, application inside. So uh, your uh, smartphone is like the, uh, the proxy. There's uh, several, the specific purposes. It's like a WhatsApp uh, uh, application, a line application for you to communicate between the uh, uh, other members, your, your family or your friends. And uh, there's a calculation uh, application for you to calculate uh, any uh, figure or numbers and so on, okay? So here, there is a several archive that so we can categorize into a biological process uh, uh, archive like a ice core, tree ring, coral, uh, and this one is a sediment core and skeleton. Uh, so from the archive, we can break down into three uh, major components it's like a, a biological process that has been, been taught by uh, Prof. Nigram, if I'm not so mistaken. Uh, he attached about the uh, foraminifera. And so we have also the physical proxies and uh, chemical proxies. So this means like chemical based proxies. Okay. And so for the archive, so archive, we have documents. We have a tree ring, we have a coral ring, we have a skeleton, we have ice cores, uh, lake cores, and marine core sediment. So but it depends on the location where you live, what you kind of uh, study you want conducted. So in terms uh, of our situation in Malaysia, we can rely on the several. It's like documents, uh, uh, coral ring, uh, skeleton, lake core sediment, and marine core sediment. Okay, uh, but uh, uh, ice core and tree ring is a, a bit complex if you want to, to uh, set up a study in a, a tropical area because the, uh, like a tree ring is more like uh, the growth rate is, uh, occurs uh, uh, for the whole year. I mean, the, uh, long, long, uh, long for the whole year, it's very difficult to, to distinguish the, the ring or the, the drum. 
And uh, ice core, so you guys, because in tropical region, it's difficult for us to, to, to find the ice core. So the potential uh, uh, archive or that we can consider in here is a document, uh, coral ring, spell term, lake core sediment, and marine core sediment. But in my study, when so we try to look at on the Holocene uh, uh, epochs or Holocene era, uh, marine core sediment is the promising uh, archive that we can uh, put into account. Okay, this one is a short term uh, scale archive. This one also you can see that's a short time scale archive. Uh, brain coral also because of the growth rate uh, about uh, three to 10 to uh, point three millimeter per year. And it's even unable to capture the changes in environmental condition. So in this study, for my uh, study about uh, the uh, geochemical uh, uh, record in the South China Sea, we uh, more uh, rely on the uh, sediment core. So if you look at here, the, the red ring here, you can see that uh, the gap, of course, you can see the gap here, there is no like a, a program that uh, uh, to collect the core sample, longer core sample in this region. So that's why, in our capability of uh, Marine uh, University Malaysia Terengganu, we only can uh, collect the short core sample. So, but, uh, but uh, you can see that uh, the red dot here, the uh, yellow dot and orange dot is a longer core sample collected in the ocean. So these are like a, when you have a core, it's like a very precious and uh, it will reflect uh, what kind of uh, study that uh, you, you want to, to understand about this area. Okay, information from the archive, the environmental proxy, how past environmental respond to the climate change, the condition of the past uh, environment, evidence and process of climate change. So in our uh, situation here, this is the location of our uh, Sunda land uh, when uh, what we call it, so the early Holocene sea level rise. When they start the Holocene, the sea level start to, to rise up. Is this due to the melting of, uh, uh, melted of uh, uh, sea ice in the uh, north or south, uh, uh, southern uh, polar region, okay? And this one, the, the uh, red area here, distinguish our, our uh, time frame we start from uh, uh, 900, uh, 9,500 until the uh, 500 years ago. Okay, then uh, this one I showed the post glacial sea level curve. This is uh, uh, here is a meltwater pass 1A and meltwater pass 1B, the event of the melted, uh, melting ice in the uh, polar region. And this one also distinguish is uh, uh, not really, well, because it's uh, uh, not really uh, obvious uh, meltwater pass one C here. But uh, uh, what I want to try to highlight here is uh, the uh, sea level rise play important uh, uh, role in the uh, Sunda shelf. Okay. And then uh, this is our sampling site. You can see here the deck is about uh, uh, 58.3 meters and the long core about uh, 158 centimeters. So that's why 158 centimeters is considered the short core as compared to the longer core that uh, people collected or researcher collected by uh, drilling technique. This one is only we use the uh, gravity coral to collect the sample by using our uh, research vessel here, uh, RV uh, Discovery. And uh, these are the core sample that we collected uh, from the several core sample. And then we choose the, the best core uh, sample and try to analyze the uh, chemical content uh, and com com chemical component uh, in the uh, sample. And uh, this is the important uh, criteria that we should uh, try to uh, establish. I mean, the age sediment and sediment rate of the uh, core sample. 
because if we uh, cannot get the the correct or the precise age model, it will affect the interpretation to, for the uh, result, the other result like uh, uh, geochemical compound and also physical uh, of the sediments. So uh, we try actually to use the foraminifera and also nano fossil to establish or to uh, set the age model for this sediment, sediment core. But uh, unluckily, we cannot uh, find the uh, enough uh, specimen of foraminifera or nano fossil to, uh, to run for the carbon-14. That's why. But we are lucky because uh, we can find the like uh, shell fragment, the intact shell fragments that uh, we can uh, analyze for the carbon-14 here. Okay, uh, and uh, sorry, uh, the age that we can cover for this uh, uh, core is up to 9,500 uh, uh, kilo years. That means uh, until the, the, what do you call it, so the early Holocene. Okay, uh, so these are the some uh, chemical compound that uh, we analyze from this uh, core, like uh, total organic carbon, calcium carbonate, uh, iron, calcium, and also mean size sediments. And we plot uh, the geochemical process here. And uh, first, for the carbon-14 to distinguish the H model, H sediment. And then so we have uh, total organic carbon and so calcium carbonate here uh, as the uh, proxy for productivity and sediment size, which reflect the energy action in the area. Iron and, and calcium also, we can see that's a source of sediment uh, in uh, the study area. So basically for the modern uh, condition, uh, when we look at on the productivity, the major productivity is uh, contributed by phytoplankton in this region and also some of the calcifying organisms like the coccolids, Emiliana Huxley, and also the uh, foraminifera in this area, planktonic foraminifera, I mean, so sorry. Okay. And so when we plot again to the age, here we can see uh, the, the trend here of uh, uh, geochemical uh, compound from our uh, side. So these are uh, first is a mean size sediment. You can see that's a mean size sediment. Show the the the, the trend here. Uh, okay, for this one, uh, the changes that uh, happen for uh, calcium carbonates is increasing from uh, about the uh, 5, uh, 5,500 years ago, and uh, the iron calcium. Uh, index. This one is show the de uh, decreasing of uh, uh, trend, and uh, for total organic carbon also. So after the uh, 500, uh, 5,500 years ago, uh, it showed the, the decreasing trend towards the the late Holocene, and uh, uh, as we try to. Uh, Interpret here is about the, the calcareous for the calcium carbonate increase is due to the calcareous material uh, formation, more abundance compared to the uh, early Holocene. And uh, for this one, you can see that's higher total organic carbon uh, in between 9,000 to uh, uh, eight, about uh, 7,800. Uh, 700 years ago. So this one is a higher TOC compound and uh, the mean sediment size also showed the, the lower sediment. So this means uh, during this period, uh, uh, mean size sediment is uh, like a coarser compared to the, uh, the others, uh, the mid to Holocene uh, era. So we can expect this one is uh, due to the location of the core area during the early Holocene is close to the uh, coastal line when the uh, sea, sea level is try, start to, to increase, to rise during the, this time. And then uh, when it's close to the coastal area, 
the uh, depth of uh, uh, ocean or sea is not uh, uh, deep, deepest compared to the uh, modern condition or to the uh, compared to the uh, late Holocene. And that's why the, the turbulence or the mixing can occur uh, very well during the, the uh, early Holocene. That's why in this uh, time, uh, okay, so, and then uh, this time, uh, when it's close to the coastal area, it might be affected. I mean, the more intrusion of uh, land uh, component, land uh, compound, like a nutrient and so on. That's why the uh, productivity is more uh, high, uh, more productivity is uh, dominated by a phytoplankton type of uh, organism. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, when uh, the uh, transgression, I mean the, the sea level rise, the location uh, slowly located far away from the uh, coastal line. And uh, you can see here that uh, the, uh, the condition is more uh, transformed from soft tissue microorganism, that I mean the phytoplankton, to the uh, hard tissue microorganism. It's like the transition from the community structure, different community of uh, phytoplankton from the uh, phytoplankton, uh, I mean the from soft tissue microorganism to hard tissue organism. Okay, these are, uh, we can't uh, expect, uh, we can't uh, uh, assume that uh, sea level rise play important uh, uh, role in this uh, uh, changes of community structure during the Holocene uh, epochs. This is a, what you call it, uh, ma mainly from the uh, uh, dynamic of the ocean and uh, sea level rise also uh, influence the, the, the changes of community structure in this area. Okay. And uh, what we can call here, the calcareous uh, material uh, formation is more like uh, uh, dominance during the uh, late Holocene. Uh, we can uh, say that uh, uh, when it's far away from uh, the uh, coastal line, uh, when the location is sea level rise is increasing, the sea level rise occur and the location is called uh, far away from the coastal line and then the influence of land is uh, uh, less uh, uh, to the uh, to the core area, and then uh, this will uh, uh, what we call trigger the the increasing or the dominant domination of uh, hard tissue microorganism compared to the soft tissue microorganism. So that's why we use uh, this index, uh, iron and calcium index, as an uh, indicator, the source of uh, sediment whether the in situ uh, formation of sediment, I mean the, the, the in situ uh, formation of sediment is dominant or a land, uh, for a land uh, uh, intrusion of domi dom dominant, domi dominant in this uh, area. So we can see that sir, during the early Holocene, it's like uh, uh, this area is uh, dominated by uh, land, and then uh, after that, uh, uh, more dominant by the in situ, I mean, the uh, ocean or uh, land, uh, ocean based uh, uh, process. Okay. So, what uh, I can say here, uh, the concluding remarks from the, uh, this kind of uh, study, we can uh, see that. Uh, uh, increasing uh, calcium carbonates, uh, this uh, and low uh, iron calcium index is, uh, reflect to the oceanic inputs or calcium carbonates uh, based organism are more dominant toward the present at the uh, study area. And uh, of course, the proxies indicate the productivity in the uh, Malaysia was changed during the Holocene that we can see that so the transgression of uh, coastal line is one of uh, the criteria. And also the, what we call it, uh, the sea level, uh, I mean, the, the depth of uh, 
uh, ocean also another factor that's uh, when the shallow water is makes like a what you call the produce uh, kind of uh, well mix between the uh, bottom and the uh, surface but uh, when the uh, deep depth of uh, ocean increase uh, sea increase in this area that's mean the more uh, the the process is not uh, uh, running very well that means uh, there's a more you can see that uh, during the uh, late holocene the sample the sample uh, the sediment is more uh, finer compared to the early holocene and uh, this finding is also important uh, to fill in the knowledge gap about the geochemical and paleobiodiversity records of the Sunda chef, especially in the uh, East Coast Peninsula Malaysia. As uh, I show in the uh, map before, there's uh, not so many research uh, conducted in the southern uh, part of South China Sea compared to the northern part of South China Sea. This might be uh, the uh, as you know, that uh, the southern part of such a Sea is very, uh, what you call it, it's uh, uh, very uh, not restricted. It's like uh, many people want to enter this uh, this area. It's like uh, uh, from China, Vietnam, and that's why uh, some of uh, the countries very try to 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 avoid the influence of uh, the other uh, uh, parties in this area. So that's why. It's very difficult for us to collect a longer core to study about a more uh, longer or longer time frame in this area. But uh, there is um, our effort here to collect even to, uh, we try to conduct until the Holocene. That is why, why the limitation is there. But uh, if we can, we can start, uh, we can try to get the longer core and study until the LGM. And uh, uh, these are only two uh, uh, components that so we can uh, highlight the productivity in this area based on the geochemical uh, proxy from uh, uh, total organic carbon that will reflect the uh, soft tissue cell of the phytoplankton and then calcium carbonates which might really reflect the pro uh, productivity based on the hard tissue cell like a calcifying organism and uh, we also now try to use another component, which is, is a biogenic silica. And this one is a biogenic silica. It will reflect the dominant uh, organism uh, that uh, ref uh, that's, uh, uh, represent for, for, the, for the modern condition. Uh, uh, diatom is more dominant in the uh, uh, South China Sea which is the productivity in modern uh, uh, condition is uh, based on uh, diatom because it's dominant compared to the other uh, microorganism in this area. So that's why we think that's uh, another uh, compound of uh, uh, geochemical compound that uh, we can use to uh, represent of the productivity in this area is by using the biogenic silica. And we hope that's uh, we can use uh, this biogenic silica and we can see the, the trend, uh, what uh, happened in the past between these uh, three components, heart tissue cell, which is uh, phytoplankton, and then uh, the heart, uh, 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 so, uh, no, sorry, soft tissue cell is uh, from phytoplankton, heart tissue cell is like a calcifying organism, and also the biogenic silica in this area. So based on the three uh, uh, compound of a geochemical compound, and then so we try to add some more of the organic uh, uh, analysis from the uh, uh, dinosterol and then so basicosterol, which is uh, more diverse or more uh, proxy that so we can uh, use this area. That's, uh, but uh, nowadays it's for, for us, it's difficult to conduct uh, this kind of analysis because of uh, uh, you know, the situation in Malaysia is uh, uh, due to the movement control order and uh, our uh, lab also uh, sometimes is, uh, we can enter the laboratory, but sometimes uh, we cannot enter the laboratory. There is uh, the restriction now to generate some more data in uh, during the uh, post-pandemic uh, condition, but uh, we try 
to uh, generate the data and maybe uh, in the future we can uh, compare with the other uh, proxy in the uh, northern part of uh, uh, South China Sea and the other uh, area and to see what kind of uh, uh, particular or what kind of uh, uh, factor influence the uh, what you call it the trans uh, the community structure changes in this area because uh, for the modern uh, condition my click uh, uh, show that uh, in this area also uh, very active in term of uh, outwelling but it's not uh, uh, intense uh, compared to the eastern uh, eastern uh, Chile margin or uh, the other uh, area like Peru margin but this one but uh, and uh, uh, we try to look at uh, the, the the relationship between the uh, this kind of uh, event the monsoon event and so on so uh, there is uh, we try to uh, go for the next uh, step and uh, of course uh, this is i think a very very brief uh, presentation by me and uh, i hope that uh, uh, i will we can uh, come up with the, the the more robust or more uh, data that we can uh, uh, share with you uh, in the future so thank you very much for your attention Thank you, Dr. Hasrishal Shari. It was a very wonderful and a comprehensive uh, lecture. Mm -hmm. Hope uh, there are some questions in the chat box. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, one question is from Mr. Suyash Gupta. Which organism produce more oxygen uh, in the ocean? OK, uh, in the ocean, uh, so I, I touched about uh, there is a hard tissue cell, soft tissue cell, but uh, in the ocean, uh, if you look at uh, the ocean uh, scenario, plant, phytoplankton is more uh, produce of oxygen compared to the organism, uh, the other organism. Even the, this kind of uh, very microscopic uh, organism, but uh, phytoplankton is kind of uh, very, uh, in terms of uh, oxygen uh, producing, is, uh, this is a more dominant uh, organism that uh, produce the oxygen in the ocean. Okay, so there is one more question from Miss Yamini Malhotra. Uh, mm. What kind of diseases do marine corals suffer? Okay, uh, for marine corals suffer, there's a, we call it, uh, for marine biologists in the UMT, they find out there's a, a white spot or black spot of uh, disease. Uh, and white spot normally um, due to the, what we call it, uh, El Nino events because of the increasing of temperature uh, in the ocean, uh, due to the El Nino, it will trigger for the uh, what because it's uh, the white spot in uh, for the coral. Some coral, even we can see that's a uh, coral bleaching. Uh, but uh, the if the temperature is keep on increasing, it will trigger for the uh, dying of the organism because zooxanthellae uh, for the uh, coral. Uh, very rely on the uh, optimum condition of the ocean. Okay, so I think there is one more mm. question from Mr. Vinod Kumar. Is it possible okay. to reduce the oil pollution or in oceans? Yeah, it's back to, um, yeah, uh, I can say yes, but and at the same time, I can say no. Yes, because uh, nowadays, uh, you can see that the uh, majority of uh, developing country we rely on the what we call it's uh, the unrenewable energy right so when we rely on the unrenewable energy uh, petroleum base is uh, like uh, cheapest uh, compared to the uh, solar and also compared to the uh, the others like uh, wind uh, turbine and also on so by hook or by crook we still need the, the petroleum to uh, generate our energy and uh, the coal also. But in this kind, uh, the, the, the cheapest uh, transportation is by uh, uh, shipping uh, or by, by ship, by, by vessel. So that's why 
uh, if we use the uh, like a shipping company or uh, like a, this uh, shipping vessel, there is the possibility like accident in the ocean. So that's another factor that uh, we can uh, bear in our mind. Uh, there's a risk that uh, we should, uh, even in Malaysia also, there's a lot of oil spill, you know? There's a, a lot of oil spill happen in the, uh, the ocean. And uh, one more thing, uh, the some uh, when uh, you don't have the good attitude, like uh, you try to, uh, what you call it, try to, uh, when you go for the servicing of ship, some, if they don't have the good attitude, they just throw the, the, the because it's uh, the oil uh, service into the ocean. That's uh, one of the, the reason that uh, uh, oil pollution occurs in the, the environment. And the second one is the, the oil spill. Okay. There are a lot of questions coming. I think your lecture was very productive. So there yeah. is one question from Sanjeev. Is there any okay. geochemical signature of pre and post mid hollows in temperature rise uh, yes because in the you if you look at on the ipcc uh, intel uh, panel governmental uh, convention uh, reports they already start from the ipcc 6 is why not me second they already uh, include the report of the paleo climate uh, uh, section but previously, they only concentrate on the uh, modern uh, changes, but starts from the IPC 6 and 7, they include the, the, the component of uh, paleo uh, climate changes. So that means uh, the paleo climate is uh, more uh, another factor that uh, should uh, be considered in the, what is uh, changing in the modern world. Because I always told them, my student and also my clique, if we want to understand about the modern uh, changes, we should understand what happened in the past. Because uh, uh, what happened in the modern world is like a cyclicity. Cyclicity, because uh, it's kind of uh, a cyclicity from the warm and the cool uh, uh, event. So that's why uh, this kind of uh, past uh, environmental uh, past event, what happened in the past, also correlate well with the uh, modern condition. If you can see that uh, in the uh, ice core record also from the uh, Greenland and also from the uh, Southern uh, uh, polar region, it showed that uh, when the, uh, for the uh, past uh, climate or the, for the past uh, uh, era, uh, even we don't have like, uh, uh, because it's the modern uh, like anthropogenic uh, CO2. So in the past, there's also increasing of the temperature happen due to the increase of CO2 in the environment. This might be uh, several factor like uh, uh, volcanic eruption and also from the uh, outgassing from the ocean. But nowadays, uh, you can see that uh, the, what you call it, the global warming is uh, accelerating due to the anthropogenic CO2 increasing after the what you call uh, evolution, uh, industrial evolution, what happened in the 1960, when the CO2 keep on increasing uh, from the industrial revolution, this also reflect well with the global warming. That's what happened in the modern. So this is a maybe in the past, we don't have the anthropogenic uh, uh, factor, but uh, in the modern, we have the anthropogenic factor. Even the, the, uh, the outer, because it's, uh, if you go for the Milankovic uh, uh, factor, the uh, eccentricity, the and, uh, three component, uh, sorry, uh, three component, the outer, outer, outer space uh, factor. But uh, when we have another additional factor, I mean the anthropogenic, it will accelerate uh, the, the, the process, the global warming, the modern world. So this is uh, my, my question, uh, my, my answer. Hope the answer is very clear. And there mm -hmm. is one more question from Govind Joshi. Uh -huh. What are the effects of El Nino and La Nina climatic processes on the productivity of East Malaysia? There is one more, uh, one more question, sir. 
uh, what okay. must be the reason for the mid holocene shift in calcium carbonate mm. and fe by ca okay okay so okay uh, in term of el nino and la nina there's a different effect actually in our our region like uh, what uh, uh, have been told by our previous speaker uh, prof uh, uh, about uh, the 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 sea lion so in this case also it will have the effect like uh, el nino el nino when uh, we go to the 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 simple component coral reef coral reef they have uh, they, they they should adapt in the optimum condition good uh, 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 temperature good uh, nutrient condition and good uh, uh, salinity condition of course when el nino has happened it will affect the uh, sea surface temperature because uh, during the el nino the, the sea surface temperature will increase that means uh, they will affect the coral reef also and then uh, of course uh, when the el nino the the when uh, increase the temperature and also it will increase the salinity also because the evaporation is very high during the high uh, temperature but uh, during the la nina condition also it will affect the coral reef because uh, the intrusion you know that's a uh, when la nina happens it will uh, more precipitation in the uh, environment when more precipitation the salinity also will uh, decrease due to the intrusion more of fresh water and uh, uh, the the temperature also decrease so this means will affect also the condition of uh, uh, what you call it environment in this area so when we back to the uh, mid holocene shift in the caco3 and uh, uh, iron uh, calcium i can say first is uh, the nutrient condition nutrient condition what's what i mean uh, but uh, we can we, we still have no concrete evidence here because we, we just uh, expectation when the location is close to the uh, land, the intrusion of nutrient high into the environment. So that's why when the intrusion of uh, high nutrient in the environment, it will uh, more uh, plankton can adapt in the environment or more dominant of plankton in the, the environment. When the uh, transgression I mean, of uh, sea level, still have uh, sea no uh, the sea line, because uh, coastal line, so the, the location is far away the, from uh, the, the coastal line. So when far away from the coastal line, the uh, influence of land so or nutrient is uh, uh, not uh, very high in the region. And will, you can uh, see that the calcifying uh, organism uh, is not really uh, depend the on the nutrient compared to the, 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 the plankton. So when that's why the, maybe the when the location is far from uh, away from the, uh, the uh, land area line, and then the some the more calcifying organism so compared the, to the phytoplankton. Coastal line. Thank you, Doctor. Some participants are asking your contact details. With your permission, can I share your email with them? Yes, yes, of course. Okay. You can see that. Okay. Oh, okay, so I will share your email. Really, uh, okay, yes, please. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, if, yes, there, please. if there are no uh, other questions from the participants, shall we move to the next one? Uh, okay, okay. Land area line. And then Thank you, sir. Thank you very much again for the invitation. Thank you, sir. So, I would like to invite uh, Professor Jamon Sunny for introducing our new speaker. Over to you, sir. Yes, yes, of course. Okay. You can see that. Okay. Okay, sir. I will share your email. Okay, yes, please. Okay. 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 If there are no other questions from the participants, shall we move to the next one? Okay. Land area line. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much again for the invitation. Thank you, sir. So, I would like to invite uh, Professor Jamon Sandhya. Okay. So, the next topic remaining in the forenoon session is on the role of legal regime for the sustenance of sustainable development in India. This talk presentation is by Professor Dr. S. Ganabadi Venkata Subramaniam from Anna University. And he is a person of eminence in environment and law he's a he has a phd in environmental management and law 
and his academic qualifications on the role are of legal regime for the sustenance he has an msc and phil before before India. doing his phd he has an msc and m phil from an, on environmental science by he has an mba s ganapati he has a degree in law from anna he is an he has an ma in public administration he, a he has an ma in of eminence personal in management in, in industrial law. relations he has an ma He's a, he, he has, has an MLS. He has a PG diploma in law. environmental law and his PG diploma in criminology and forensic science. PG diploma in public relations. He has a PG diploma in higher education. Before doing his PhD, he has an MBA. Thus, his academic qualifications are endless. He has an MBA. He has a degree in law. Apart from that, he has an he has a 30 years teaching experience. He has been a consultant in environmental impact assessment. He has an MLS. He has a PG diploma in environmental law. And his PG diploma has been working as a consultant for various projects outside the academic field. He has been in many monitoring committees appointed by courts in various environmental related cases. He has been member or coordinator in various government appointed committees. He has been he has been awarded many times for his excellence in environmental related activities. He had published around 100 papers in national and international journals. He has been a consultant for various projects outside the academic field. He has been in many monitoring committees appointed by courts in various environmental related cases. He has been member or coordinator in various government appointed committees. He has been awarded many times for his excellence in environmental related activities. He had published around 100 papers in national and international journals over to you sir environment and the university of madras at chennai and i would like to extend my heartfelt thanks especially to professor dr suresh gandhi who has extended this invitation from the university of madras and professor dr tarun who has extended this invitation from the christ So very good afternoon, good afternoon, good morning to everyone. The topic which is being given to me that is the role of legal regime for the sustainable for the sustainable development. Now, uh, for now, I have been here. Yesterday was also I was witnessing for like two hours the program, and today just witnessing the uh, uh, the talk which was given prior to my lecture. I think it is a very very interesting one. And my topic is not related to the geology and the My topic is totally a different one. That is, it is totally a legal one. You see that law. Unfortunately, the you just to compare the situation from the foreign countries and Indian countries. That is the Ganapati. That name must must come. But unfortunately, Ganapati is coming only at the end. Then secondly, the law. The law must come only in the beginning. Even for the environmental degradation or the climate change or anything. That is that law is the most Most important, but unfortunately, in the legal of Indian condition, the law will be coming only at the end. That is, most of the time, the law is used in the foreign countries as a management tool, but in the Indian situation, it is used as a litigation tool. Suppose you wanted to stop the project, that means then you are filing the case, then getting the stay order, beginning, then that case will be prolonged for endless years. So this is the scenario. Now coming back to the topic, sustainable development. We all know that uh, the sustainable development is that in the year 2015, United Nations has set up the 17 Agenda for the Sustainable Development. That is the 17 Goals of the Inclusion. And nearly 193 countries have joined together, and the main agenda is that all the people must enjoy the peace and prosperity by the 2030. And there were seventeen goals. Of course, we all know that what are the seventeen goals. And in that seventeen goals, nearly five of them are related with the sustainable development. Uh, sorry, for five, five of them are related with the environmental goals. The good health and well-being, clean water and sanitation, clean energy, sustainable cities, climate action. All these things directly are indirectly related with the environmental action. And based upon that, that the environmental performance index was. 
have also then, then course, and unfortunately our Indian condition was the 177 in the list and the first one that is that is uh, India sorry that India uh, performance index 177 whereas the food was in 1.42 clean water and sanitation okay. clean what is the definition for the sustainable development we all know the development is taking care of that uh, development of the present generation without the compromising in fulfilling the needs of the future generation this is what the definition is that being given in the year 1992 to the Rio Declaration. Okay. Now, people will say that after the 2016 only, the sustainable development has gained the momentum. But in my opinion, I can say that even in the year 1992, namely the Rio Declaration itself, the sustainable development world has been point. And in fact, we, uh, I just wanted to say one point here. In law also, you will be having the soft law and the law hardware. See, like uh, the software and hardware, now, like a soft water and hard water, even in the law also, you've got the soft law and the hard law. And in the law, you will come across, in, in the international law, you come across the declaration, conventions, protocols, covenants, agreements, multilateral agreements, unilateral, sorry, bilateral agreements, like that, you will come across the different, different terms. These different, different connotations or the different terms have got their own meaning, both in letter and spirit. Now the declaration. Declaration is considered to be only a soft law. Whereas the convention is considered to be a hard law. For example, when I say Stockholm Declaration, Rio Declaration, Nairobi Declaration, agreements, all these declarations are considered to be the soft law. Whereas the Climate Change Convention, United Nations Framework Convention on the Climate Change, Ramsar Convention, Basel Convention, Mandrill Convention, all these things are the part of the hard law. Then you come across several agreements. Whereas Several covenants the also, they are all coming under the part of the hard law. Now we must know what is the difference between the hard law and the soft law. A hard law is something judicially enforceable. Suppose a country which has given the test, which has signed in that hard law agreement, and after it is being duly ratified in the parliament, or in whatever that way the country is having their own governance system, then it is giving some sort of an assurance to the international body that it will be bringing a new legislation in consonance with the agreement they have signed, that is the hard law they have signed. In, if already there is a legislation is existing in that particular country, means they will modify or amend the legislation in accordance with the agreement they have signed. This is more an obligatory. It is not an advisory. So, and non-performing of that one, the other countries which are partial of that particular agreement have got the, uh, what is that, legal right to initiate appropriate legal proceedings by way of bringing the matter to the International Court of Justice or they can issue the sanction against the country also. So this is the called as the hard law. Whereas in the case of the soft law, it is more on the advisory. It is not an obligation. It is now that Stockholm Declaration or the Rio Declaration are all considered to be the part of the soft law. Now the way I wanted to give the difference is so now Rio Declaration, we will in that Rio Declaration for the first time in the year 1992, the Sustainable Development World has come. But it was the soft law only. But India has gone one step ahead. Even prior to that agreement of the General United Nations in the year 2015, after this 1992 Rio Declaration, in the year 1996 itself, in one of the judgments of the Supreme Court, the Honorable Supreme Court said that Sustainable Development as long as it is not contrary to the municipal law, it is nothing wrong in infusing this principle in part of It was the soft law only. This is what in that Vellur Citizens Welfare Forum versus Union of India case in the year 1996, Justice Kulpit Singh, in the course of his judgment, he has retained the law. Now, that 1992, what was the sustainable development which was part of the soft law under the Rio Declaration? Not now it has become the path of the hard law in the year 1996 through the judicial intervention. How many? We all know whatever the judgment pronounced by the Honorable Supreme Court is in the law class. So now you see that even prior to 2015, 
that is that the Kannada 95 countries, the Kannada 93 countries come and signed that agreement. We must be very proud that India has given the sustainable thing is at the odd loss status. Whatever the project which you are doing, you have to follow whether it is sustainable thing, environmentally, socially, economically, we have to work out. But again, I can say that the law, even though in the year 1996, it has been the court has intervened, but prior to that also, if you just see that the design and customs and banners, we must be really follow that sustainable development in all our aspects. If you just see our uh, Indian habit, Indian habit from morning to evening or whatever the practices which we practiced from time immemorial to the normal Indian condition, it is very much advocating the sustainable development. In fact, I can very well say that recycling, reusing, reducing, all these three R's were also very much highlighted in the sustainable development. But whereas we, the people of India, have gone one step ahead, that is the fourth R, even respecting our environment also. That I need not tell you that so much amount of the historical evidences, our very much what is this one, our religious evidences, everything will prove that how far we have respected our nature and given the due status for the sustainable development. But unfortunately, due to the entry of the Western culture and the consumeristic culture, we have forgotten, we have shifted from our original culture to the consumeristic culture. Now the Western countries have to come and remind us what is the sustainable development. This is what the status of family and the status of Okay. Now that we all know what is the origin of the sustainable development. Now coming back to that, how far the sustainable development is being sustained because of the legal regime. Now you see that for a good environmental management, in my opinion, I can say that the three years, of course the fourth year, which is very much emerging in the recent past, in the last 10 years, this is very, very important. What are those three years? The first one is the education. Okay. Yes. Now that we unless otherwise people have been taught what is environmental friendly and what is non-environmental friendly, it is very difficult to follow the sustainable development. And in fact, for that reason only, even the Supreme Court in one of the judgments has made it mandatory of introducing one subject, namely the environmental science and engineering, compulsorily in the academic curriculum uh, throughout the length and breadth of the country with the same syllabus. And this one no one can alter. Whether the student is studying civil branch or mechanical or electrical or any branch, one paper is a compulsory in the undergraduate program. The purpose of that one is that we have to think important at the younger mind what is this as sustainable environment that is that is imparting with the environmental education. Because we have I have seen several people who are having the strings of degrees in the diploma, but as far as that environmental knowledge is concerned, it's very poor for the matter. We can quote several examples because of the paucity of time. I don't want to go much in detail. In fact, the realizing this importance of importing this education through non-formal or informal or non-formal way, not only to the students, but also to the other domains of other, uh, what is this, conceptions of our society, whether it may be the advocates or educators or academics or teachers, and it's the specific types of audience like the doctors or the conservative workers like that, the government is funding through the various organizations, including the, our Anna University or IIT or the Pollution Control Board, and they are Running three days, four days, a short term program also in imparting this environmental education, specifically in the capital or to the specific audience like a hazardous waste management for the industrial people and the biomedical waste handling management with respect to the hospital people or the municipal solid waste management that the conservancy workers and the corporation and panchayat. Now you know that importance of education. The second one is the engineering. I need to tell about the engineering. 
ಅವರು ವಿಕಾಸ ಆಂಗ್ಲ ಪದರವಹಿಸಿ ಇಂಜಿನಿಯರಿಂಗ್ ಟೆಕ್ನಾಲಜಿ ಇಸ್ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಓಕೆ ಬಿಫೋರ್ ಪ್ರೊಸೀಡಿಂಗ್ ಟು ದರ್ಡ್ ಬಿ ಐ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ವಾಂಟ್ ಟು ಹೈಲೈಟ್ ಫೋರ್ತ್ ಬಿ ಮೇ ಬಿ ದಟ್ ಎಕನಾಮಿಕ್ಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಪರ್ಟಿಕ್ಯುಲರ್ ಎಕನಾಮಿಕ್ಸ್ ಇಸ್ ರೀಸೆಂಟ್ಲಿ ಎಮರ್ಜಿಂಗ್ ನೌ ಪ್ರೀವಿಯಸ್ಲಿ ದಿಸ್ ಎಕನಾಮಿಕ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ದಟ್ ಎನ್ವಾರ್ಮೆಂಟಲ್ ಗುಡ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಅವೈಲೇಬಲ್ ಅಟ್ ದ ಫಿಗರ್ ಆಫ್ ಅಂಡರ್ ಅದರ್ವೈಸ್ ಬಟ್ ನೌ ಸ್ಲೋಲಿ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಬೀಯಿಂಗ್ ಫ್ರೈಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಫಾರ್ ಎಕ್ಸಾಂಪಲ್ when you are walking through that marina beach now they are started even putting some sort of a charges for that suppose if they wanted to what is okay. this they wanted to this yes, small lake is there or a park is there in addition to paying of the tax we are compulsorily have to pay like a toll tax in order to maintain that that is that so you see that and uh, of course there are other things are also slowly emerging that is that including of that waste disposal cost along with the numeristic cost or if you take it in a technical way we say that is internalizing that externality which is slowly emerging in our Indian scenario and Indian situation. Why I am specifically saying about the Indian situation we say in India if you read the preamble of the constitution that is the justice, social, economic and the political. the social justice was given the top priority but if you just see that the economic aspect so you slow the social justice you likely to get to defeat for that what but what to do because previously it was the scenario which is existing at the international and the global level you see what has happened in LPG liberalization privatization and globalization and secondly it was not a bipolar world it was a unipolar world and slowly the capitalism is also inviting an inroad into the social issues one way or other so there are lot of political influences and there are lot of international influences which is making us our country also slowly to increase its economic regime into our what is this one into our environmental management regime okay now this is the third one that is this the third one is supposed to be the enforcement and this is the topic which is mainly for me now what is the enforcement we have got a set of rules and regulations and notifications by law and law the law and there must be some sort of authority who is empowered to enforce this legal regime in okay. our now for the purpose of this legal regime ah for the purpose of enacting this type of the legislation whether we are having the constitutional regime in our country yes this is that we must be very proud that india is one of the few countries in the world that this environment to protect is being given as a constitutional status and what is this constitution you just see the preamble of the constitution that is the equality and equality it is very much advocating that is the what is this one sharing of the resources ar what is this this is the thing is equal equal equally sharing constitution is in our country and if you could extrapolate yes, this thing to the environment we think it is very much advocating the sustainable development world yes, we have got the different what is this one uh, the fundamental rights the directive principles say, and the various schedules and in that one the state list is centralist concurrent list and all these things are there if you just extrapolate it or if you just see the spirit behind that on the it is is very much advocating okay sir. apart from that through the 42nd constitutional amendment we have introduced new articles in the 42 and 51 ag thereby imposing a duty on the part of the state to protect the environment and thereby imposing a duty on the part of the citizens to protect the environment and the environment we do the everything and everything and everything for the fact that things are there okay sir. constitutional regime is there and constitution has given the provision to enact the law also now based upon that what has happened that is we have enacted several legislation and these legislation in a broad category can be two aspects one is the de environmental law and another one is the environmental law and what is the difference between these two the de the specific that is the definite or when you put de environmental law means these environmental laws 
for constitutionally meant for the purpose of protecting our environment. What are those laws? Namely, the Water Act, the Air Act, the Environmental Protection Act, the National Green Tribunal Act, the Public Liability Insurance Act. These acts are the Environmental Act, which is the definite article of B. Then what are these environmental laws? There are other laws of B. Take, for example, the Factories Act, Bombay Colaba Coast Act, the Police Act, the Environmental Act. In there also you are finding several sections with reference to the environment, but without mentioning the word environment, it is very much advocating the public liability of hygiene for that matter. National Green Tribunal Act. I can go to the what is the different sections because of the time factor. I don't want to go in detail. So we have got the ample of legislation are available in the country. Okay. Now for the purpose of what is this one? The in there also. For the purpose of government, are enforcing this one, but we have created the central level and the central police control board, at the level of the central state police control board. Then we are having the Department of Environment, Ministry of Environment, Power of the Prime Minister also. And we have got what is this one? A good amount of administrative regime is also there. Okay. Now the three pillars and columns of the democracy. One is the what is this one? The law making body. Law in Enforcing body ah, and law enforcing body. Now law making body, parliament has made the law, and we have got that water act is there, air act, and so on. And these acts, we can go in detail and study that how far these acts give adequate provisions for the government of water body. Then the air atmosphere, then we come across the environmental. What is this one? Environmental protection act. It is the umbrella act. It gives the complete what is this one? It protects the All the aspects of the environment and and one of the specific what we have got the water act, the nature of this act is that the speciality of this act is under the section five of the act we use the power to the executive to make the rules regulate the bylaws. Then like a blank check is given based upon that several rules and regulations have also been brought to take for example the number of municipal policy management, municipal policy management, and the rules on environmental impact. Rules. Then you come across the public hearing notification. Then biomedical waste management and the rules. Hazard waste management. Like that, we have got several special more than hundred rules and regulations. Bylaws have also been brought. Then we have got the public liability insurance act. Then for the purpose of speedy disposal of the cases. Now when the matter is going to the court, it takes an enormous amount of time. It consumes a lot of time. Consumes more energy. Consumes more money. And the outcome is also uh, 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 what is this one? It is a win-lose situation. And again, we have to follow a large amount of the court procedure. Now, in order for the, you know that the problem that is that uh, justice denied is justice denied. In order to accelerate the process of the justice, justice is speedy justice. The government of India in the tribunal has to create an enormous amount of tribunal with the five benches, with the principal bench in Delhi and the southern bench in Chennai. For the speedy disposal of the case. Okay, sir. Now this is it. I told you about the best law making body, law enforcing body. You got the board and the ministry and the department is there. The third one, which is the most important law interpreting body, are that is the judiciary. Again, the judiciary has also contributed a lot for the environmental management. Take for example, I told you in the beginning in the year 1996, for the first time, the sustainable development. उंटेबल्टेबल्टेबल्टेबल्टेबल्टेबल्टेबल्टेबल्टेबल्टेबल्टेबल्टेबल्टेबल्टेबल्टेबल्टेबल्टेबल्टेबल्टेबल्टेब
again. And that is, you know, if you study the environment of laws, it is more a criminal war. In the criminal war, it is where he is making an allegation against the people. It is on the part of the A to prove beyond all reasonable doubt by producing all the evidence and witnesses and giving the due opportunity of his being feared to the B and cross exam by giving an opportunity to cross examine the B also. After that, the re-examination, then only it has to be proved beyond all reasonable doubt. It must go to the conclusive proof. Now, coming back to this is what the criminal jury should have. Now, coming back to the same uh, principle when you apply for the environment of law, now you are making an allegation that particular industry and effluent is being discharged. It may create a cancerous cancer, it may, be, a, a, it may lead to the cancerous growth, uh, what cross-examining the bee cancer, or it may be affecting the human health, soil health, like that when you are saying it. Now that the other person, when you are making an allegation against the person, if that person will ask, come on, you fool. Without the proof, the it will be only an empty allegation. It will be a vacuum allegation. Now, now if you ask it to prove, it is not unlike the other criminal case. Even this there, you can collect the evidence and witness it. But here, science is going on developing. So, at this particular point of time, you may not be having the adequate, what is this one, scientific tools to find out what is the, uh, what, 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 what is the consequences or what will be the impact of the particular chemical or what will be the impact of the particular product or anything and everything. So, you are in a position of being not able to prove, but your law will take to apply the criminal, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 what is this one, criminal law, you start, you, 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 you have not proved. So, but here you are unable to prove. So, just because you are unable to prove, that does not mean it has been disproved. You can take into consideration as yet to be proved. So, by taking the fact in that particular angle, the Supreme Court said so that you have to apply the precautionary principle because if there is any damage which has been done, means if it is beyond beyond repairable means, then it will be the society will get proved. Environmental health will get proved. So, you see sustainable development of one country in the lively one means the precautionary principle is one of the what is the case by one? What is the case principle? This is also announced by, this is also given by the Honorable Supreme Court in one of the judgments, namely the value system. If there is any damage, one who is polluting has to pay whatever the pollution he has done. Now you may be asking me, sir, just because I am polluting, I am paying it. So do not think this is the right to be given to me for the polluting. No, it is not, it should not be interpreted. That way. You must interpret it that you must take all the precautions, you must take all the precautions and other things for the purpose of the healing, arresting this pollution. But because of the what is this one scientific tools are available at that particular junction, you can be able to do in this one. In the later case, it has been found like that means you have to pay in order to retrieve back to the original and This is not a license to pay. So you must take all the precautions. But Still, if you are polluted, you have to pay. Now you can able to see applying this principle. The government are also putting a lot of tax on the old vehicles, and the NGP also has made tax. Well, what is this one? So under the polluter case principle, ask several industries to pay from this one. In the later case, it has been. What is the third one? The third one is that absolute liability. Again, it was also given by the Supreme Court only. What is that absolute liability? You must. Now there are three types of liability is there. One is the strict liability, another one is absolute liability, another one is the vicarious liability. In the case of strict liability, what is this one? There are certain exemptions of being given. What are those exemptions? There are certain things which are beyond my control. For example, the tsunami or the cyclonic storm or the earth factor or the volcanic eruption or what is this one? Some act of the unique or act of the terrorist or if somebody has meddled the thing, I have given out all the provisions to my body, my industry or whatever that has hazard the place I have taken all the precautions. But because of these factors, it has escaped. There are the exemptions of sufficient quantum of the damage. Means it, why should I be given the responsibility for that? Which is beyond my control. This is what under the strict liability. But now, the Supreme Court has given the judgment that in 
we are here in after we have the absolute liability there is no exemption at all so here we have to be very proud over that one why it means even in the developed countries they are following the situation where as we have got one because of these okay sir what is the fourth one namely this public trust doctrine what is the public trust doctrine again it was given by the supreme court in the judgment kamalnath versus union of india liability what it is said that is the government is not the owner of the property government is only the guardian and custodian of the property when you are a guardian and a custodian means you must be only for the purpose of rent or you don't have the right even in the development or over you are up to abuse if you use it means that everybody has got the right to okay sir what is the fourth one so now that is the public trust mountains or the coastal areas or whatever the land which is not however which is not covering the title rights by anyone means the government is actually claiming the right if you call it in the language of the prabok land those lands if the government is using it for the purpose you do not think for it is using or it is going to affect the environment or health use then we have to bring that a public trust doctrine so now that is the public trust so again you see that what the past now what is the fifth one you see that i told you we when we talk about the fundamental right we need to read in all this about freedom of talk is freedom of speech is freedom of liberty freedom of movement like that freedom to practice your religion freedom to what is that all freedom to congregate without arms like that we need to do but one more right that is that uh, what is this one uh, right to life that is right to life is conferred under the article 20 the constitution you see now the dream code in the judgment as said that environmental right is also part and parcel of the fundamental rights under the article 20 one of the constitution then for example the that the for that the supreme court said that is but providing a clean clean and healthy environment is also one of the that is the right right to life right of having the clean health and uh, clean and healthy environment now also one of the fundamental rights under the article 21 of the constitution and the right to life now the question comes if this right if the government is not providing a clean and healthy environment for example it can come out to the violation of the fundamental right under the article 21 of the constitution so you are getting a one more right under the article 21 is to approach the court either the high court or the supreme court to get back to our clean and healthy so now by the innovatively interpreting our constitution the supreme court has made the environmental right to give the right under the article 21 of the constitution okay sir now that because the time is also very limited after our i just want to summing up so you are getting okay sir you have said about the what is this one various legal regime is available in the legal regime of like so and availability of the constitutional regime of the you have highlighted then availability of the uh, what is this one enforcement regime also you have highlighted but in spite of all these things why we could not be able to achieve or why we could not be able to get the expected results now you are talking about the climate change now climate change is okay you have all talked about the, what are the various contributors of the climate change okay this is that and all but if you can be able to see the legal angle this is the most important one how do you know what is the situation happening at one what the situation in sri lanka or the bangladesh or the pakistan the burma or the bhutan or even the what is this one that the tibet no and at present what is happening at afghanistan now because of some internal disturbances the people are migrating to the neighboring countries they are forced to migrate now if there is an internal disturbance and they, they cannot be able to survive means of the life in the limb they have to stay out to go to the neighboring country or some other country it is the duty on the part of the other country to do as Asylum for them because they are all the refugees. Or if there is a war is being declared, you can be deported from the refugees. They are taking that asylum. But now I am linking it to the climate change. Now because of that climate change, then there is no rain at the rainy season, and when the drought is continuing, and a particular region of any country, and the people don't, especially the agriculture, the people who are depending on that asylum for agriculture. 
they were not able to survive if they started they migrating to the neighboring country in order to make their life but to live now whether the other country has got obligation to give asylum to that country there is no refugees and these refugees are called as environmental refugees now that internal disturbances and the aggression are actually a war that is a different one now because of this climate change and now they can say these climate change are the change in the weather pattern of the climate pattern is not because of the activities which are taking place in my country it is something which is taking place in some other part of the world or some other part of the other country and the effect is being felt in my country and because of that my livelihood is being affected my life is affected so i have to forcefully to migrate here the place i can be able to survive so in that case they can those say, people have to those people have to give the asylum to the other people because climate pattern is not the point it may be affecting the in the name of the environment of those people so they may be terrorists may like to come to and the other the problem the like we talk about the problem of the country and so there are other legal implications for it how just to give one only one thing with reference to the legal the climate change is going to be there the place i can be able now coming back to that we are having the several like those people Told you, but we cannot be able to impact hundred percent for all the reasons. What are those obvious reasons? We all know there is a good amount of the political interference is there, corruption is there. Then our administration should not be able to what is this called given the full free hand to enforce it properly. And above all, if you do that enforcement also, again this sometimes the livelihood is also being cut. we cannot so we must along with you that what is this one right to life is a right to clean and healthy environment is also part of the fundamental right under the article 21 of the constitution right to life but right to livelihood is also a right to life so suppose if the people are in the uh, same in the environment you know that what is this one put it area that complete that area is only for the people who are free and if they put a lot of their livelihood if you ask the people to vacate it on one day is their livelihood is getting affected similarly by saying so that you are completely my you are asking the people to vacate on the thing of area without the proper rehabilitation means then the livelihood is getting but right to life because livelihood is also part of the cycle so suppose we must have first to take into consideration the livelihood after that on the cycle i will say after that so we must properly integrate the livelihood that is number one that is the our environment and impact the specific is more and what is more industry specific rather than the area specific industry specific okay the industry is there the industry is there the industry is there they are within their limitations of the limit in this one whether that particular area has got a carrying capacity to carry that that is the what is that the waste or the pollutants that is released from the various industries whether they are having to go so normally in the foreign countries they will work out the carrying capacity accordingly they will give the permission to the industry but and what we see in india we are giving the industry we are not taking the country just carrying the capacity of industry this is what we can very well say that is the human habitation in the very these people will be uh, getting the pressure for they will be getting the electricity and carry that thing what that is one other card is everything there after that only they will be developing the infrastructure facility too, like a road a street like this all these things in the foreign countries they will develop that infrastructure facility after that the people will go here people will go there after that the infrastructure facilities will be developed so this is the research you can very well then again that sir am i having the time mr tarun ji getting the pressure for they will be getting okay since he has not said the benefit of doubt in favor of the accused so i am proceeding policy that only what is the policy that is tarun sir so i am here sir ha ah, so how you give me that yellow card so that i will just yes sir since you are in a flow i didn't mean to disturb you oh, okay, okay, okay 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 so now coming back to the second one that is the pa environment impact assessment now you see the government has got a lot of policy has not said the benefit of doubt in favor of the mobile phone like that three laptops so one thing now 
those areas well along with the during the nine december nine no, what is this one? november december january and all that might have been discussed that we will be burning this waste in fact several times the supreme court has summoned the again that we have the uh, punjab and haryana but that action is being slowly taken now this is contributing lot of the problem of the green is that in fact most of the time the flights are also diverted to from delhi to land at some other place because so much of the people more now agriculture commission again has been agriculture commission has been the first to come to pass that one is not the right and again normal policy has to on one hand the government is saying we go for the concept of yeah we go for the green land where we go for the organic produce but on the other hand they are also giving no subsidies for the fertilizer so automatically i will be tend to go only for that one also so slowly a shifting of this one so it is a it is a something like a, these policies are also contradicting with each other so like that we can quote a any number of the things even our legislation also the loopholes are available take like for example that in eu now previously it was 20000 now it has become 30000 previously it has become 200 meters for the proposal over what is that river bed now it has become the 100 meters we want the development to but in certain cases we have compromising our environment so there is no other alternative now it is a question mark whether we need that environment or we need the development again that the sustainable development how far it is to be sustained this is what the question mark and loop finally the matter goes to the court and whatever the judgment is made out the supreme court by the judge that has become that word of the sustainable that is the situation which is there now what you can say and we have got with the biological waste to give you a high you lose one man which is considered as a biological waste you have to deep bury or burn it but on the other hand the whole body is not you are burning it along the river bank you are burying it and then are even back in the backyard of your house also do you not think that it is not a biomedical waste it has to be identified by the judge by way of incineration or deep burial again that question is that much is there and again if anyone to be able to say that law it is more beautiful Education oriented means okay. okay. Then we are going to go. That is by way of filing the court, going to the court, argument like this. If it is being used in that manner, that means it will be a win-win situation. Here it will be a win-win situation, consuming a lot of the time. Okay. So then we can put several things. Now, finally, I started with the three. Because our Arun Sir has given me all the minutes, okay. Extra for three minutes was given. And finally, I can say that the four years are very important. Now, at the end, I can say that three years are very important. If you want to find pollution free, not pollution free is important. Secondly, no one can say that my activity is a pollution free. Even by today, I did. We are taking the carbon, we are taking the oxygen, and releasing the carbon dioxide. So. That is every activity we say passing some quantum of the pollution. We have to only regulate it. We have to minimize it. Nothing can be devoid of pollution. Somebody has asked whether the uh, whether inside the sea area whether it can be completely removed. No question of pollution. That part that we can only. that we wanted to change the name as a pollution control board to pollution regulatory board regulating means you are channelizing it it is very difficult to control it and moreover control means it has got an authoritarian board whereas a regulating means it is more a diplomatic board also and when you say that i am the controller means who are you to control i have got a funny right like that people will talk but i am a regulating means only i am channelizing the pollution i am not controlling you so like that that in I mean, I mean that the final one I regulate the EP, regulating and the Canada that is the political is very difficult. That is the most important part. So, and if any more of the control gets it, it has got the main means. It must be a regulating means. It is more the second one is the public part. When you say that I am the controller, right? Who are you to control? I have got the power. You can be able to see several parts. Then, but I am regulating, not being regulated. Most of the time, that will be also like that. That English master interest. That is guiding the regulatory body and the public and that is not participating, participating really. not only participating in the one or the passive but active part it must then only the project will get the success to the second one go all public that is we not we are not the 
ോക്കിംഗ് <laughs> if some participants have some questions you are free to ask now yes 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 something the full liberty to you to put any questions doubts clarification criticism comments thank you sir that was really wonderful even though we we geologists are always speaking about the sustainable so development thing, we were not aware, aware about this much and laws and here and some 25 so 30 years back the environment was viewed in a uh, resolution way that is it it is I more on the public health and hygiene now that the environment is all the same it has to be given in the international and even legal and international and the global status now you see that most of these environmental laws legislation is developed the because of the international development is taking place taking for example the climate change now you can see that india is a sovereign socialist secular democratic republic this is a sovereign country i have got every right to pollute my own atmosphere i have got the title see this is my house i have got my title so i can use my house for any purposes and like that you can claim it similarly this is a sovereign country no country has got any right to poke the nose into my internal affairs so i am burning this fossil fuel or i am burning this one and that one who are you telling me to say that now that is all not able to do because this like pollutants does not know the national right pollutants does not know the sovereign i have got the title and whatever the pollution you are doing it it will be having the impact my whole country but now with the result is so much amount of that international legislation is all coming and so many countries are joining by the way of the internal efforts and the agreements and this one making inroads in our sovereignty and making our domestic legal regime to develop in consonance with the international take for example the biodiversity convention or this is my country i am using this land to that land no bio ഓട്ടോമാറ്റിക്കലിമേറ്റിക്കലിമേറ്റിക്കലിമേറ്റിക്കലിമേറ്റിക്കലിമേറ്റിക്കലിമേറ്റിക്കലിമേറ്റിക
place to stay here you should Montreal don't be at the zone for the temperature is only for the drinking of water boiling the water and drinking it are not allowing the water to stagnate to leave the must go bleeding those days are all gone now that the environment has got in respect of the international level so many legal regimes have developed are dictated by the international one we have to forcefully develop our internal domestic legal regime and in fact i can go one step back and i can say that it has got an effect on the business also it has got an effect on the gag it has got an effect on the wto also one of the clause in the wto very clearly says that a country is exporting a product to the b country means if that importing country say if the product is not manufactured as per the law what is dictated by the product is one of the requirement of the friendly manner as per the laws of the importing country the importing country can go into a ban of importing that particular product in that country now that question mark here are here comes means say a is a sovereign country b is a sovereign country how can you apply that b country's law to the a country that is the question mark number one then if it is not environmentally friendly environmentally friendly is a very loose law what is environmentally friendly to the germany may not be environmentally friendly to the united states or even in india it is a very loose law third one the manufacturing process of that particular product say when i am purchasing any product from the shop means i don't bother how it is being manufactured yes, the whether the product is an affordable price how the product is you are giving the service for that one at least two aspects for me i will be looking at now if the developed country says this is not manufactured in it is a pollution free or it is not in the green manufacture so here and after we will not be importing if they issue a ban means then which country will get affected and so most of the times the exporting countries will get affected because they will be losing lot of foreign exports so bother how to go to only one example that is take for example india is the largest manufacturer that one is the leather pan tomorrow if any of the foreign countries are importing our leather they say that our leather manufacturing is not environmentally friendly as per the laws of our country here in after we will not be importing your leather means that which country will get up your ban is not that important that which country will get up your ban like india will get up your ban because we will be losing a lot of water because we will be losing a lot of water now coming back to that why i wanted to use this this particular point means that now environment can be used as a tool in the hands of the politicians both at the national level and the international level it can be so we know that law can be used as that uh, what is that so as well as shield now this particular legislation or this particular thing which can class can be used as an effective tool if they wanted to curtail the development because developing country so now you can able to see how far the environment and legal regime is playing now the role at the national and the international this is what the point is that like this supplement which can complement yes now you are not in liberty to ask because there is one question from actually Okay, sir. The, what you have said is very true, and there is one question from Dr. Lindo Adapar. What if the environmental law stands against the so-called the development interest of the country? What would succeed, environmental law or the interest of the nation? Yes. All these laws have been enacted. Certainly, bit to be. Yes. What is this now you are not going to be able to ask because we need to be very much sustaining our sustainable development only. There is the, no doubt. But the question of our implementation. This is what what's the, the problem. The law stands Certainly, the so for example, we are asking very, very comprehensive environmental law or the interest of the nation. Now, yes. yeah, law. In that All law, we are having the environmental impact assessment and notification in day. and in that yes, one we have to carry out the eia study what is the existing environment what will be the effect of that particular industry or the particular project that comes from that particular area that is affecting and what are all the mitigation measures you are going to employ that the environment which is going to get up now now our eia notification clearly states these are all the projects which cannot be done by the general one it has to be done one Only by the government. Now category A, category B, one category B two, and in this project we have to affect. What, what is this one? The state government can do the clearance. We can the city government come and give them the clearance. It has to be submitted to the CR. Then the state government can submit the clearance. Then the state government can give the authority. Like that, we have got a wonderful deal. Now we are here. We are not doing this. But the question is, in the form of 
implementation and when you are submitting your EIA report also, then the committee has got every power to go and instruct whether you are doing the previous business really. Number one. And secondly, this EIA report is available to the public domain. Anyone can get at and have the access of the EIA report. Third one, this EIA is how to do the public hearing. Again, in that the public hearing that the report, in the addition to that, as a right to information act, also you can get the report. Then the public hearing has to be conducted on the all over to go and see with the proper, uh, what is this one, advertisement and announced. Then, because previously only the people who are likely to get the contract are the people who are indirectly or indirectly the resident of that particular area can only go and do the service. Now, anyone who is residing in any part of India as a citizen of India, you are in addition to go and participate in any of the public areas. You can supplement and complement your own suggestions. Then the government has got an obligation whether to take it or not to take it or how it can be, what it can be mitigated that thing also they will be highlighting all these things as far as the rules regulations you notice that this is very much there so of the implementation that i can be able to talk to you in a public forum because as being the government servant and you will also be knowing that is as a general public as well as as a uh, what is this one government servant you will be knowing that's what i said it in a diplomatic way it is that political then the callous attitude of the people, the corrupted of the thing, what is very corrupting in the uh, what is this one, execution or in the administration, all these things are being able to contribute, which cannot be able to effectively and you will also be knowing regulations as a general public as well as as a uh, what is okay, sir, there is one more question from Dr. Linda Alapat. Yes, sir. Do we have a land use code that certain area only could be used for residential area or? Or some area for agriculture, etc. And the under percent we are having with the contract is that land use planning has to be obtained by the community. And uh, certainly we are having with it that uh, already by using your emergency map and all of them, they will find out what is the district area, they will find out this is the earmark of the industry, this is the residential district. Do we have a land use code that certain area only could be used for residential area or some area for agriculture? It will be all the person also with the result of one land use may be converted into other land. Now you can be able to see most of the time these agricultural lands are being converted into the colleges and the schools. If you just see it, most of the agriculture, nearly 60 or 20 colleges among them, most of the people who are in the city, outside the city are used, but in the town, you know that. Now our agriculture is also not yielding that much quantum of the money. So people are selling that land. And after selling that land, that what they are saying is they are doing in the U.S. Because even for the college, all of you have to do it. Schools, they are doing it. Now you can, they will say, you whether your agriculture is a sustainable practice or you doing it, at least in our colleges, we are doing the sustainable practice. That argument they will say. One. Second one, land use. Conversion of the land use, yes. Is the political will is there? That that the political will means the politician's will is there, and so suddenly they can be able to convert it inside the cabinet as well as in the majority. If the party is having a majority, now you can they will say you whether you are agreeable converting the land. Then in that case, what is the remedy when you ask me? Then the remedy is going to the court. And again, the court is sometimes we say this is the policy conversion of government will be interfered with. Okay, sir, I think it was very clear. There is one more question from Dr. Babu Nalisami. Please clarify on the sterilite issue of Tamil Nadu. Yeah, sorry, sir. Sorry, I don't want to put it in any way. I kindly do not put it in any embarrassing situation because this is a very, very a politically a sensitive one. Being a government servant, I cannot be 
they could implement in the UGs, but whatever the government gives it, it is the good one, I can say. Yes, that is it. The government has already stopped by using that one thing which one. Under the Article 48 Yeah, on the Constitution, it said, okay, it has been stopped, now the production has been I don't want to stop it. Now, during the corona period, that was used to only for the oxygen, that is the oxygen manufacturing only, and that was also given only as a point and permission. After that, it was stopped. That is also but whatever the but in my opinion, whatever the government at present taking it, it is accepted by the people as well as the political party. Beyond that, if he comes one to one, he is not there is one more question from Mr. Triveni Angit Uma. Uh, how can we obtain government map defining coastal regulation zones and which government department has to address issues regarding the same? Government map, you can get it from the and if it is not with reference to any of one to one, but it is different from other things, certainly you can be able to get it. That information now you can be able to get it. And the purpose of getting this information must be accepted by the people who show you are giving you are giving the information with certain conditions. Uh, yeah, yeah, that one. Because, see, this is our democratic country. Provided if that particular information is a privileged document as per the article, then they cannot be able to share that. Otherwise, whatever they are able to share it, it is the mandatory on the part of the administration to share it. And you have got the constitutional right to get the thing also. But of course, these rights are not the absolute rights. They may say that tomorrow. You should to come across that, 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 that this has been shared with the certain person, or this has been used for this and that. You will be attributed for the prosecution, and you have to undergo the legal punishment. Like that, they impose a class, and once you have given the declaration, then if you misuse it on any way, then you will be subjected to punishment. But of course, yeah, sir, am I audible? Yeah, hundred percent audible. Yeah, I am Yamini from. Manamala University. I am totally agreed whatever you are saying that imp implementation is the important part and if I would have been in your place then same issues I have been facing. Just from more than one hour I am observing there is an idol behind you it's a Ganpati. Even though at that time stone age I would like to add implementation was there you just see Ganpati is having the elephant face and human body and he survived. Totally agree with whatever you are saying. <laughs> so that is my that point and I'm very thankful. I really love your words, your presentation and it was genuine to the point and 100% correct. Thank you so much. You are from the Malhotra, you are from the Punjabi. Yeah, I am Punjabi but I am doing my since you have also achieved so many degrees I am also, I did four masters and now I am doing PhD in geoinformatics from Chennai because I found <laughs> Tamil Nadu is the best place to do the oh, okay, your okay. Words, your I presentation and it was genuine to the point okay. and 100% <laughs> correct. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. So, from the so time constraint, we will have only one more question. Yeah, yes, okay, okay, any other time questions, time no problem. Like okay, sir. Since you there have also from achieved so many degrees, what are your views on the private mines which are proving to be environmental hazards? Private like that, you are a, what is that, a chartered geologist or a, somebody who has empowered after getting that permission, he is only certifying it. Now, as per the EAA, he has to take this much quantum and after that he has to close the thing also. Everything is there as per the rules. But the question is, during the time of the exploration, you may exploit it and the government is not looking at the thing or the political interference. 
that is for yeah. yeah. now private nothing wrong in giving to the private private is doing it after making this green environmental impact assessment to study see the government giving the permission to close the business to quantum again the government is paying that hold it if you break it more than that what is required then you will be subject for the punishment then you will be the government will also make it several inspections to whether you are doing it or whether you are carrying it properly everything is there that is implementation this is what the suppose the government is not want to say because it has to do with this problem the camera is there it is just a window that hit the window that means the camera out of order more than that what is required so within that just one day if the camera is not working you can take at least one bucket if you take several that will be <laughs> fetching 20000 25000 everything is there one bucket means in the bulldozer in the front one is one bucket means in the bulldozer you know that front one is that is jc means that is called as a bucket if you just take one bucket to scoop it and on the way you just unload <laughs> it you will be getting at least a minimum 25000 camera out of order for one more than that so within that just one day the camera is not working every doubts has been cleared and it's very clear that uh, so much doubt has so much questions have arrived from this session so i believe and i strongly say uh, suggest that your class was very effective and very uh, refreshing for us thank you for you to share my uh, dr tarun you will be knowing my email id as well as my mobile number yes, you kindly share it with yes, sir, our I participants ah uh, sure sir sure sir because this is the purpose of holding this type of the conference uh, so, so much doubt has so much questions have arisen must maintain a sustainable relation so, also so mostly on the academic interaction so you uh, take a class with you all class other very effective are most very they are most uh, welcome to call us. me through the email thank already thank you for the sharing sir you just put my email uh, uh, sure sir sure sir my mobile number 9340607073 ah sure sir you can just put it in your chat box very clear ah sure sir so that this will be a continuous like a sustainable development and continuous interaction most of the geology and geology is also part of that environment ஜியாலஜி <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Sir, for your uh, uh, readily acceptance of our invitation and your valuable lecture, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. You are the picture. Sure. So, I would also like to extend my. Uh, what is this one? Humble thanks to the organizers of this conference in India that is the last convocation, and it was only that the last minute. In fact, it was only a, a present accident, I can say. And I happen to meet uh, one of your uh, what is this one? Organizing secretary, Dr. Suresh Jain, and immediately he took the invitation and gave a lecture. Then Dr. Tarun has called me and said, "Sir, will you be my assistant?" I would also like to say, "Okay, no problem at all. I will accept." I consider it is an honor to be on here and I will certainly honor you to come but I don't know if you ask me to talk about the geology it will be a brief and present action but I will be talking about in my own mind so that I can talk in a more authoritative way that is that if I talk something prepared and talk in this if you ask is a difficult question I am not in a position to answer my ignorance will get exposed whether I prepared an answer or answering it in the next term for you so for that reason I told him this is what my domain is. If you could be able to accommodate, I don't know. So well, then okay. Then he said, "Don't worry, sir. Actually, after interacting with you for nearly 20 minutes, I got my impressed. So certainly, I will somehow or other, I will insert you with me, but one way in one form or another in one session, sir. And Dr. Tarun has done that way. Uh, Plan that way. Done that thing. 
ah, he has inserted in introduced thing is at least in the third day in the last session but i am very happy even after my session only dr suresh gandhi is going to give his speech so i would like to thank dr tarun sir and dr suresh gandhi for extending his invitation to me number one and secondly i would like to extend my humble thanks to both tarun ko madras university and mother university they uh, and they we are doing it we don't require yes, any formal thanks because it is our what is this one namavit kalyan this is our our house marriage it doesn't require my session only so i must thank only i must thank along with the university of madras christ college christ college uh, the administration of the christ college through dr tarun i would like to this invitation finally i would like to extend my humble thanks to the participants participants in the kalyan college for the thanks and just before the lunch session the number of the room one is our our house marriage it doesn't require as interesting as possible for i mean and i feel that they have asked us all the questions as to be able to understand you have not only given that years to hear but the minds to listen then through the period of the several questions i am very happy in future also we will have a good amount of interactive academic interaction certainly and my email id and my telephone number that i like tarun my humble thanks to everyone have a nice one afternoon we will see about that that is well thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir it's it's our pleasure sir so dear participants we will uh, leave for lunch we will start by 2 pm uh, we will be having two exciting sessions one is from dr M Suresh Gandhi and other is from Dr. Fatin Izazi Minhas from Malaysia. So after that we will be having our validity session starting from 3:25 p.m. and we will be having Dr. S K Varshini, uh, head International Corporation, Delhi uh, Department of Science and Technology, Delhi as our chief guest. So hope. we will be uh, meeting after lunch. the lunch we will thank start you by 2 pm uh, we will be having two exciting sessions one is from dr m suresh gandhi and other is from dr fatin izazi minhas from malaysia so after that we will be having our validity session starting from 325 pm and we will be having dr s k varshini uh, head international thank you thank you thank you delhi uh, department of science and technology delhi as our chief guest so hope we will be meeting after the lunch we will thank start you. by 2 pm uh, we will be having two exciting sessions 